Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Dan Barker. I'm co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, national organization of atheists and agnostics who work to keep state and church separate and to educate the public about the views of non-theists. In 1988, we made a film highlighting some of the brave plaintiffs in U.S. Supreme Court lawsuits keeping religion out of government. Let's watch Champions of the First Amendment. After dark, a crowd of teenagers approached the door singing Onward Christian Soldiers and had a long post or a board and began banging it into our front door, which was a very substantial front door. Uh, but as I recall, it shook the house. At least my, my memories might have been exaggerated over time, but it was a rather scary situation. And it uh, reached a point where my mother opened the door to be greeted by a barrage of vegetables and rotten vegetables and, and uh, other debris. And my mother is not a person who uh, cries much or, or um, prone to breaking down, but I think that experience really did uh, lay her flat. In the late 1940s, Vashti McCollum became a champion of the First Amendment and religious freedom. Concern for the welfare of her children, especially her oldest son, Jim, prompted her courageous legal fight against religious indoctrination in the public schools. This documentary is about religious freedom and about defenders of that freedom. It is the story of the McCollum family and two other champions of an unpopular cause, the constitutional right of non-believers to be free from state-sponsored religion. We have three sons, when the oldest one was in the fourth grade, he ran into this program of religious education in the school, public school, on school time. He came home with a note from the teacher that we were supposed to sign, give him permission to participate. We didn't approve of it. We thought that it was uh, religious indoctrination. It was the sort of thing that shouldn't be in public schools. And also, we didn't uh, want the religious training in any case. So we kept him out of the class until the peer pressure became so great, even the public school teacher called and asked that we permit him to participate. Finally, we let him take the course for a few weeks, and we saw that it was pure and simple religious indoctrination. It wasn't a course in general morality and good, uh, wholesome, happy living. And so we took him out of the course. The pressure continued, and when it came to the point that we couldn't resist it, I took it to court. Being the only child who didn't participate was a bit lonely and uh, generated a great deal of hostility from the students and to some extent from the teachers. And the hardest part was being so isolated from everyone else. It seemed that uh, I was just about the only one uh, in the school that had nothing to do with the course and consequently uh, had very little contact with anybody except certain teachers who were concerned about my well-being. But generally, it was just like being isolated from the community. I suppose if there had been an even split in the class of those participating and those not participating, I would have been left in the classroom to study during times of the uh, religious instruction. But since I was the only one, they uh, initially they put me in the teacher's office in the first school I was at. In the second school, they put me in a desk in the hall, which was generally used for detention purposes. 
Uh, eventually, uh, when my mother complained, they placed me in the music room, uh, which was also a place of detention and caused uh, certain remarks from the teachers as they came by. But if that, at that, that was better than sitting in the hall. It was a, a program which took time and uh, uh, it, was a, it was an inconvenience to the school day and routine. But a more serious problem was that uh, at the very outset, a religious census was conducted to find out what numbers of students were, uh, what the population was, uh, religiously speaking. And it segregated from the very outset, just from this preliminary religious census, on through the actual conduct of the classes, segregated people by their religious beliefs. Uh, no longer was it any secret whether you were Jewish or Catholic or uh, in, in uh, our case, atheists. So I think that in terms of actually invading a, a uh, essential public area, as education is, and segregating people out by religious beliefs, that it definitely was a very, very un-American intrusion into the system. Unfortunately, the public, I think, started out confused and remained confused as to what my mother's contention really was. The facts of the case were uh, that it was, her contention was that it was an unconstitutional violation of the separation of church and state for sectarian religious groups to come into the school and offer classes, especially on school time. The public, on the other hand, perceived this as an attack upon religion. We had uh, church services devoted to this discussion of this woman. And of course, the children uh, took it, made it pretty hard on our boy that didn't take the course. There was a lot of publicity, and the publicity, and well, it just created a lot of furor in the community. While we had plenty of telephone calls all hours of the day and night, and I think sometimes after it seemed that uh, Sunday evenings were the very worst when they'd heard a good sermon that morning on the subject, and then they would go home and think it over. They'd call me and they'd give me the, the works about filing this case and objecting to their children having religion in the schools. And of course, I didn't mind their having religion for their children. It was a very good idea if that's what they wanted. It's just that I didn't want religion for my children, and if I did want it, I would have it on my own conditions, and that wasn't in the public school. We received an awful lot of correspondence. I tried to answer it all, but unfortunately, many of the anti-letters were not signed. The letters in favor of the action were, uh, well, they far outnumbered the antis, and they were well written, they were well thought out, and they would come at the rate of sometimes 100 a day. We really were in a sort of a state of siege, and it often found its way as to uh, the kind of ridicule that you would get from day to day uh, with your classmates at school. Uh, often you would hear a rumor that they were going to lay in wait for you on your way home from school and you got a little creative as to how you picked your route home. There's no question that uh, that kind of thing has an impact. Uh, perhaps just as cutting would be the parents of your playmates, your friends, telling you that they didn't want you to play with their children. Bashed at the time she filed suit had been, well, the previous semester, had been a, an instructor in the University of Illinois Department of Physical Education. Uh, at the time she filed suit, uh, the reverberations immediately traveled to Springfield where a legislator drafted a resolution that it was the sense of the legislature that atheists shouldn't be employed by the University of Illinois. Uh, he dropped the resolution when he was assured that Mrs. McCollum would not be rehired. There's no question that my mother bore resentment uh, to the town uh, forever after, partly because of the general prevailing hostility. The townspeople, the, the general community feeling was definitely hostile. But I think what actually 
was even more of a problem to her was that her, her friends in the university, people who were her colleagues, my father's colleagues, people who had expressed sympathy with my mother's point of view, backed away right after the suit was filed. Uh, when it became big news and controversial, people and allies evaporated very, very quickly. And I don't think she ever got over that. As for the rest of us, my brothers and myself, uh, I like to say that the experience can be character building if you survive it. It's a strange thing, but no matter how difficult it seemed to be along the way, I don't believe I ever seriously considered giving up that case. When we had the decision from the circuit court, and it was such a ridiculous decision, you thought they'd never read the Constitution, let alone the state the laws of uh, Illinois. I just couldn't uh, take that decision, so it was just natural to go to the Illinois Supreme Court. And at this point, we got a new attorney, an attorney who was an authority on constitutional law. Although he lost in the state Supreme Court, we knew we were on pretty good, pretty good ground. There had been a case decided by the U.S. Supreme Court the year before that seemed to bode well for us. And so that was the Everson case. So we went on to uh, the United States Supreme Court. And I must say that all during these trials and tribulations, and they were quite a bit for a person that had never expected this sort of thing, we never seriously considered giving it up. The United States Supreme Court decision in favor of the McCollums declared sectarian religious instruction in the public schools unconstitutional. The strong 8-1 to one decision was a resounding victory for separation of church and state. The McCollum case legally was a very significant case. It is the first case decided by the United States Supreme Court that actually held the activity or action of a state municipality to be unconstitutional under the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Originally, the the court in Barron versus Baltimore had held that the First Amendment of the Constitution did not apply to the states because the First Amendment starts out, Congress shall make no law respecting and so forth. So consequently, it was not until after the Civil War that the, when the Civil War amendments were passed, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, that the uh, sleeper in the 14th Amendment uh, became available. And for us, it became available uh, in our case when the Supreme Court held that the Due Process Clause included the Establishment of Religion Clause. This had been discussed in the Everson case the year before, but the McCollum case was the first case where an action was actually held to be unconstitutional under that particular provision. All the cases that have followed thereafter in the church-state area have been based primarily on the McCollum case and the language of the Everson case. Uh, this includes the Bible reading cases, the prayer cases, uh, all of these cases that involve aid to pro public schools, or aid to parochial schools, and religious uh, activities in the public schools. Religion in the public schools became a burning issue once again in the late 1950s. Ed Shemp, a champion of the First Amendment, challenged prayers and Bible reading in public schools on behalf of his oldest son, Ellery. He came home one day telling us that uh, <clears throat> he felt that the, uh, the, pre the present entered, uh, use of religion in the schools as practiced in Abington was patently illegal. And he as much as told us, what are you going to do about it? This, I think, initiated our whole uh, thought about uh, religion in the public schools. Uh, we took it up with, uh, uh, Ellery took it up with the ACLU, of which we, I was a member even before this particular time, the American Civil Liberties Union, and um, that began a six-year term which ended in 1963 with a Supreme Court decision that called prayer and Bible reading in the public schools illegal. Meanwhile, Ellery was doing his own protesting in school. He took a copy of the Koran in, and when the other uh, children were reading the Bible, he read the Koran. 
uh, when they were supposed to stand, he sat down for the Bible reading. Uh, this, of course, did not endear him to the uh, school authorities. They did, however, um, allow him to leave the room while these, were, the, while these um, things went on, but this was hardly any um, uh, remedy because the PA system glare, blared all over the school in um, hallways and so forth. He went down to the, he was allowed to go down to the homeroom teacher or down to the principal's office while these ceremonies, and they called them Bible reading ceremonies. Uh, devotions was another name they called this. There was no question that this was a religious exercise. In fact, that's what uh, uh, the whole case amounted to, is the fact that this was a religious exercise. It wasn't the fact of Bible reading per se or prayer per se. It was a religious exercise which was uh, accomplished with the help of the school authorities, of the public school authorities. In other words, the, the state has no reason to enforce uh, any religion or religious, ex particularly religious exercises on the students. The students are a captive audience. And to make uh, uh, one particular religion, really the official state religion, of, uh, the state uh, sponsored religion, is very unfair and completely against our Constitution, in which all uh, religions are supposed to be equal. You have your choice of any religion or no religion. And that has to be enforced. And we think our case kept up the, the, the proudest of, of that tradition of separation of church and state. In 1963, the United States Supreme Court ruled eight to one in this landmark case that devotional Bible reading and prayers in public schools are illegal. At the time in 1963 when this decision came through and the big black headlines say school prayer out of the schools, we got numerous letters. We got probably, we figured about 500 different letters and postcards. We got innumerable phone calls, some of them at 2 a.m. and things like this. <clears throat> but basically, uh, we did not have, uh, we didn't suffer un undoubtedly. We lived in a, uh, in a community which was very mixed between Jewish, uh, the blacks, Catholic church nearby, and uh, while I'm sure they didn't all approve of this, and true, I thought it was in very true American fashion that they put up with this. And incidentally, about one third of the uh, mail we got and so forth was on our side. And um, we like to think that the, the intelligent letters were all on our side <laughs> because some of the letters that were against us were pretty sad, I'll tell you that. They, the language they used and the um, uh, the things they hoped would happen to our children, they told us, and so forth, were um, anything but helpful to the, to, our, to the laws of the United States. While the McCollum and Shemp cases have determined prevailing law against religion in the public schools, Torcaso versus Watkins is a unique affirmation of a related constitutional principle that there shall be no religious test for public office. Few would have predicted that something as simple as becoming a notary would result in another landmark Supreme Court decision. But that is what happened with Roy Torcaso, another champion of the First Amendment. Well, this began as a result of a request from my employer to become a notary public in Montgomery County, Maryland. He operated a real estate business, and it would be convenient for him to have a notary in the office instead of having to go miles away to get a notary to put his official seal on documents relating to mortgages and loan applications and so forth. My application was submitted, it was approved, and I was instructed to go to the courthouse in Rockville, Maryland to get my commission. Uh, when I arrived there, the clerk of the court proceeded to read the oath of office, which I had never heard before, and it included two paragraphs. The first paragraph is a conventional pledge to support the Constitution, to obey the laws of the state, and diligently and faithfully, without partiality or prejudice, to execute the office of notary public. And the second paragraph, which offended me very greatly, states as follows. 
I, Roy R. Torcaso, do declare that I believe in the existence of God. This I could not accept. I do not believe in any form of the supernatural or any divinity. When I was told I could not be a notary, I went to the law library at the university where I had previously studied and researched cases relating to the office of notary public. I found absolutely nothing there that gave any clue that the state of Maryland had any right to intrude itself into my religious, religious meditations. So I went back home and talked to a lawyer, a neighbor, friend about this, and he agreed to take the case. We filed a suit for a writ of mandamus to compel the clerk of the court to issue the commission. I was defeated in the circuit court. We appealed to the Court of Appeals of the State of Maryland, which was the highest court in the state. I was defeated there, so we appealed to the Supreme Court of the United States. And on the 19th day of June, 1961, the court rendered a unanimous verdict in my favor, a unanimous decision, I should say. Uh, and I think as a result of this, that freedom of religion is stronger in this nation today than it was prior to this litigation. I would like to read just one paragraph from the decision at the Supreme Court level. This decision, incidentally, was read by Justice Black. He says, we repeat and again reaffirm that neither a state nor the federal government can constitutionally force a person to profess a belief or disbelief in any religion neither can constitutionally pass laws nor impose requirements which aid all religions as against non-believers, and neither can aid those religions based on a belief in the existence of God as against those religions founded on different beliefs. Soon after this case uh, had been decided, I picked up a young man who was a student at the junior college near my home, and in our conversation, I learned that he was in the sociology department where a friend of mine was the professor, and the professor had discussed this case in their class. Uh, after some minutes of conversation, I identified myself as the plaintiff in this suit, and this young man was absolutely thrilled. When he got out of the car, he shook my hand most vigorously and said, Mr. Torcaso, I'm so pleased to meet you. You're one of my minor heroes. I think that is just absolutely delightful. Today, the right of freedom from religion is increasingly under attack. I'm rather concerned about the situation today. Uh, there is a trend to the right, and I am afraid that if there are additional conservative appointees to the Supreme Court, the work that has, the, the, the case law that was established from the McCollum case uh, through the subsequent uh, prayer and Bible reading cases, could very easily be undone. Perhaps there's greater threat to the Bill of Rights and the establishment of religion clause uh, than perhaps any time in this nation's history. Well, there will be many more cases in the courts, and they will end up in the United States Supreme Court, I'm sure. I just hope that the decision in the McCollum case, which in the past has been the precedent, will prevail. Because if we have Prayer in the public schools, whose prayer? And if we have tax credits for the uh, family sending children to parochial schools, that money siphoned off the educational uh, program, I see nothing but uh, great harm to the public schools. Not only that, but I think that uh, more and more the parents will elect to send their children to the more exclusive schools, which will be the religious schools. The children that can't make it will be, quote, dumped in the public school system. And you will no longer have the melting pot that we had that was so valuable in the United States, the service of the public schools. So I, uh, I see nothing but uh, disaster for the public school system if we have these practices uh, prevailing. And I think that people will see this, will challenge it in the courts, and I hope that the McCollum case will prevail. 
There can be no freedom of religion without the freedom to dissent. It was a victory for all Americans when Roy Torcaso, Ed Shemp, and Vashti McCollum fought and won court battles, ensuring the separation of church and state. Religion and its implications, this sort of thing, has always been one of the least of my worries. I just have had a very happy life and a very fruitful life, and I get along with people, and they, generally speaking, get along with me. And religion is for the other guy, I guess, or at least organized religion. I'm a humanist, and I've enjoyed that uh, philosophy. I felt satisfied with it, and I just uh, don't feel the need for any organized supernatural religion, and never have. That was Champions of the First Amendment, produced by the Freedom From Religion Foundation. If you'd like to join us or would like information, visit us at ffrf.org. Thank you for watching Free Thought Matters, because free thought matters.